So, I'm Bobby Knight. Uh, I'm a certified beekeeper with the University of Georgia slash Young Harris College through the Georgia Master Beekeeper Program. Today I'm going to be talking about Apis mellifera and Varroa destructor and how the most prolific parasite of honeybees goes undetected. Uh, for those that don't know, Apis mellifera is the scientific name for the European honeybee. So a brief introduction to Apis. And I'm sorry, but when it's in presenter mode, it won't bring up the things down here, so I gotta change it over here. Uh, they're only native to Eurasia, which is Europe and Asia is the... <laughs> you okay. touched it. Okay, uh, it's the largest land mass in the world. There's 20,000 known species of bee, and of those 20,000 known species of bee, only a single one of them produces honey, which is why it has the name honeybee. And there are different races of honeybees. Um, races is not the same thing as species, so kind of think of like dogs, how you have different breeds of dogs, but they're still all uh, dogs. Um, we have ones that are like Italian, Russian, German, Caucasian, there's a ton of them. And we have different ones because they're selectively bred for honey production, um, how many bees that they actually make in the hive, how gentle they are, you know, whether or not they're going to sting you if you just look at them wrong or if they're just going to let you be. Also, their resistance to parasites and diseases. And this is just a lineage showing roughly how long uh, Apis mellifera has been around. So about 150 million years ago, uh, off of Hymenoptera, you have Epidea that showed up, which is the family that Apis mellifera belongs to. And for those that have taken genetics or just have an interest in lab insects, everybody should recognize the fruit fly up here, just mm -hmm. off of right. Orion Gaster, mm -hmm. which has been around for about what, 220 million years. So bees been around for 150 million years. They kind of have everything down pat. They, they got it down to a science. Honeybees have a haplodiploidy sex determination system. I'll show you a picture of them in just a minute, but this is just an easy way to represent this. The queen is the only reproductive member of the whole hive. She's the only uh, one that goes out and gets mated. So she controls the sex of the eggs. She's diploid, she has two sets of chromosomes. She can choose to fertilize the egg, which will make it uh, um, diploid and present, cause you to have female workers. And if she chooses to leave the egg unfertilized, then you have male drones. They're, dip, they're diploid, or sorry, they are haploid. They only have one set of chromosomes. And due to this uh, haplodiploidy, drones only ever have grandfathers. They have no fathers. And in the hive, females outnumber the males 20 to three. This is during the season only, because as you go into winter, they kick the drones out because they provide nothing of benefit to the hive. They don't guard, they don't pollinate, they don't bring in anything. And pretty much they're cheap and expendable. So <laughs> the females have nothing to do with them, they kick them out. Uh, the actual picture of the bee down here at the bottom right, that is a drone. And this picture just shows um, uh, nurse bees. These are female worker bees. They're over the eggs in the nest. And this picture shows just the two together. You can see how they have different body morphologies. They're just, they're built different. Which, so which one's the drones and which one's the... Sorry. Uh, this is the drone, and these are, are all female worker bees. And then this is the queen, and she's different from the other three, or the other two as well. Um, there's three casts of bees, and this is the only reproductive member. This is the life cycle of, or not the life cycle, this is the development cycle of the honeybee from egg to larva to pupa to when they emerge. They all start off the same. The queen lays an egg. Three days later, it hatches out as a larvae, and that's where they start to differentiate. The queen is fed royal jelly only, and she develops into a queen. Her cell is also much larger than the other ones, and it's orientated above the ground. I don't know how she doesn't fall out, but somehow she doesn't. 16 days later, you have a queen emerge. Then the one that takes the most longest, or the next longest, is the worker bee. Workers and drones are fed a diet of 
Royal Jelly for three days, and then after that, they are switched to just worker jelly. 21 days later, you have the worker emerge, and 24 days later, you have the drones emerge. This part becomes important when I get to the parasite here in just a minute. And this video is gonna show what that development looks like, but in real life. Here is a bee egg as it hatches into a larva. Those newly hatched larvae swim around their cells, feeding on the liquid food that nurse bees secrete to them. Then their head and their legs start to differentiate as they transform into pupae. Here's that same pupation process seen from above with varroa mites running around in the cells. Next, the tissue reorganizes in their body and the pigment slowly develops in their eyes. In the last step, their skin shrivels up and they sprout hair. The varroa mite that you saw running around in the cell, that's what I'm focusing on here. That's the, uh, the parasite. Um, but the goal of beekeepers and of the hives themselves is basically just to get strong, healthy hives that have a lot of bees and are free of any pests and diseases. Um, you can see this frame right here has a bunch of, bunch of bees on it. And also his hives back here have a ton of bees in them. And that's gonna produce a lot of honey and it's gonna provide a strong foraging force so that the bees can go out and pollinate uh, crops, which makes them economically important because pollination is a multi-billion dollar a year industry and the food that results from that is an even larger industry as well. So if you don't have strong, healthy hives, you're not providing the best service that you could to your clients. So. The methods that I use to get my um, my papers, use Google Scholar and I typed in varroa mite and then I tacked on to the word varroa mite evolution, behavior, bee detection, bee interaction, oxalic acid, bees, and then also I just typed in the actual scientific name of the mite, varroa destructor. So this is varroa destructor. This is a large, um, well, the picture, obviously, it's not this big. Uh, <laughs> if it was in relation to on a human, the size that it is on a bee, it would be roughly about having a turtle about this big on your back. Oh, no thanks. <laughs> uh, the majority of the information that I got from the Veromite comes from a uh, paper that Rosencrantz, Almeyer, and Ziegelman. I, I spelled his name wrong. It's Ziegelman, not Ziegel Alman. Uh, so, what is a varroa mite? Well, it's an obligate ectoparasite, and that means that the only animal that it can parasitize is the honeybee. It cannot live on anything else. Uh, an ectoparasite means that it lives outside of, of the host versus an internal parasite like tape worms or something like that. They were recently discovered. Uh, varroa mite or Varroa destructor specifically was found to be a different mite from what all the research papers prior to the year 2000 thought they were, which was Varroa jacobsoni. And uh, there's actually two stages of the Varroa mite in the hive. There's the reproductive stage where they're actually infesting the honeybee, and then there's the phoretic stage, which is the free living parasite going around in the, in the hive. They're found worldwide except Australia and the reason why is because when this mite was starting to be found out, Australia kind of like shut down and they inspect very rigorously all of their incoming beehives and they also quarantine bees before they even let them come into the country because they don't want to interrupt any of their beekeeping practices that they have there. And the varroa mite, the varroa destructor mite, 
was found in hives starting in the 50s, started in Russia. And then after Russia, they made their way into Europe in the 60s, and then they were discovered in the US in 1987. And Rosencrantz said that uh, due to it being discovered that it's not uh, Brua Jacobsoni, that all papers prior to the year 2000, almost every single one of them, actually are talking about Varroa destructor instead of Varroa Jacobsoni. Varroa destructor is absolutely devastating to honeybee colonies. Uh, Dr. Delaplane with the University of Georgia has said that what will happen is that if hives are not treated and there's no intervention on the part of the beekeeper or the bees themselves within two to three years, the hives will die. So what they usually see is in feral populations when honeybees or when varroa mites come in, the feral populations of honeybees will take a massive hit and if they're not completely wiped out, they do somewhat recover later, but nowhere near what they used to be. So how does it go unnoticed by the bees? The biggest factor that Rosencrantz found was pheromones, which these are the smells that are released in the hive. Uh, varroa mites, they have certain smells to them and so did the bees as well. One of the most interesting things that he found was that the cuticle, the, the exoskeleton of the varroa mite is made up of the same hydrocarbons that the cuticle of the honeybee is. So when the nurse bees go around and they're feeding or inspecting the cells, the varroa mite smells just like the bee. So the bee's like, oh, nothing's wrong here. So, you know, just let this giant parasite, you know, continue eating your babies. <laughs> uh, they also discovered that there are volatile compounds in the hive that either repel or attract varroa mites. Um, earlier when I, when I talked about the royal jelly and the worker jelly, royal jelly is found to repel varroa mites, like they physically run away from it. And this makes sense because if the queens are infected by the varroa mites, that's going to trigger a response from the hive because that's the only member of their hive that reproduces. That's the most important member in the hive. And also it doesn't make sense from a parasite standpoint that if you infect the only member of the hive that can make more of the things you need to, to uh, grow yourself, just they just stay away from the queens. Um, they found that worker jelly actually attracts them and they will what they did is they set up uh, in the lab, they set up samples of compounds that had smells similar to worker jelly and actual worker jelly themselves. And they found that the varroa mites went to it. But the one smell in the hive overall that attracts them more than anything else is the smell of brood, which is the baby bees. They could not find any way at all to get them to not go towards baby bees. The other way they go unnoticed is they physically play hide and seek. So when the the mite first goes to infest the cell, um, she will go in the cell a few hours before it's capped over. And the worker jelly that's down at the bottom of that cell for the baby bee, she will bury herself in that. And she breathes through this uh, paratrine that the parasite has and it allows her to not suffocate. Also another way that they play hide and seek is that on the bee itself, they typically like to parasitize the bee and hide in them or on them on the ventral side, which would basically be our stomach side. And bees, they have segmented bodies, but on their abdomens, they have like overlapping plates and they hide up underneath those plates, which makes them very hard to see. So my hypothesis is that the European honeybee, Apis mellifera, did not co-evolve with Varroa destructor and therefore has no natural defenses against this new threat. And the reason why I say this is because Varroa destructor did not emerge from Europe. It emerged from Asia, specifically on Apis serrana. So Apis serrana is the Asian honeybee and this is the range of Apis serrana, and it's also the natural range of Varroa destructor. Varroa destructor does not impact uh, the Asian honeybee 
nearly at all in the same level that it does with the European honeybee, and that's because there's a different host parasite relationship. For one, the Asian honeybee does not let the varroa mite infest worker brood at all. It only allows them to infest the drone brood because drones, they're males, they're cheap, expendable, they don't care if they die. So another strategy that Apis serrana has is that if they detect that uh, drone is multiply infested with you know, more than like two or three mites, um, they'll actually just leave it in there to die. Because when baby bees emerge, sometimes their sisters, the nurse bees, will actually help them emerge out of the cells. Well, if a uh, bee is too heavily infested, what happens is it has trouble getting out of the cell. Well, the Asian honeybee recognizes this and they just cover it back up. <laughs> and they call this entombment. And what it does is it, it obviously it kills the drone and then it also kills the varroa mites that are in that cell. And I just mentioned the uh, drone control. Um, so it jumped host. Well, how did it jump host? That should be playing and I don't know why it's not. Oh, there we go. Um, so we keep uh, honeybees because they're, they're easily managed. You can move them around and we can move them to different crops that need to be pollinated. This right here shows one way in which the varroa mite could actually physically jump host. Asian honeybee lands on a flower, European honeybee lands on the same flower, varroa mite sitting there waiting for it. And it just jumps over to it. And due to the fact that their host can fly and are kept by humans, and you know, humans like to put things everywhere, they were able to spread worldwide and allowed them to have global domination. Uh, the blue areas are places where Varroa Destructor is not present. I kind of question the blue over here in, in Africa and in the Middle East because you, you see how much red is around it. It doesn't make sense that there would be no Varroa mites. The only thing I could think of is uh, Rosencrantz said that one uh, difference between European honeybees and Africanized honeybees, well Africanized and African honeybees is that they swarm a lot more and that's how they reproduce. Basically the mother hive splits and another hive goes off. This creates an imbalance in all the baby bees being born and it prevents the mites from having their population continue. So it, it halts them pretty much. This is the varroa life cycle. So earlier I just had the uh, development cycle of the honeybee. Well now it's the same, but you have the mites. So this is a mite that is currently parasitizing a, a nurse bee. You touched it. <laughs> yeah, but when I want it to work, it doesn't work. Okay, so the little red dot up here, that's the varroa mite. She's waiting for, specifically she's called the mother mite. She's waiting for uh, the cell to almost be capped over for the larva to turn into a pupa, and that's when she infests that cell. And this is a actual picture of how big the mite is on, on the uh, developing pupa. This just goes into more detail. Um, Rosencrantz found that the first egg that is laid is always a male, and every single egg laid after that becomes female. And the most interesting thing he found is that all the phoretic mites, so the mites that are not currently parasitizing honeybees, the ones running around on the combs, they have a large terminal oocyte on them, which when they go down into the brood cell, they can immediately lay an egg, and this becomes the male. After the male hatches, he mates with his mother, and then every subsequent egg that is laid, he mates with his siblings. And they found that the males always prefer the youngest females that are, that are emerged. And one reason why they believe that to be is the older that varroa mites get, the less fertile they become, to eventually they become infertile. However, they do not know how this happens and they don't know how to trigger it. They're currently trying to figure out how to make that happen. And this just shows a little bit more detail. You see, mother mite goes in, first egg, 
becomes this male, and then you know you get more and more and more until you emerge with three on you. Not every single mite that is born emerges with the bees. They don't know why that is either, and some of them just die in the cell. And this is showing drone brood that is heavily infested. You can see there's just a, a ton of mites there. It's just nasty. So why is this a problem? Well, if we're infested with parasites, they're constantly draining something from us, and that just takes away your energy and basically your life. This up here is also a bee that is suffering from a virus called deformed wing virus. As you can see, her wings are not developed at all, and she also looks extremely sickly. So it, it shrivels them up in addition to their wings as well. Uh, so the impact of that, a study that was done by Le Conte et al. in France, they were looking at honeybee hives that had not been treated. And they found one of, their, one of the results, which has an economic impact, is honey yields. So this gray shaded area right here, that's what they call Varroa surviving bees. Those are the hives that are not treated versus their control, which is the white bar here. Those are hives that are treated with uh, typical miticides to control the varroa mite and basically kill it inside the hive. They found that the difference between untreated versus treated was statistically significant. And for each bar at the top, you have the numbers of hives that they sampled for that current year. Like for 2001, they had 65 um, untreated hives produced almost almost 15 kilograms of honey versus the 71 treated that produced almost 34 kilograms of honey. That's a huge difference if you have, if you're a commercial beekeeper and you have thousands of hives. They also found that some of those untreated hives lived up to 11 years, which just baffles me because I have not heard of anything like that happening at all. Um, this is a population uh, growth curve of the honeybees, which is the yellow line, versus the mites, which is the red line. This is from a biologist in California who's also a commercial beekeeper named Randy Oliver. He hasn't written any research papers that I've seen. Um, he just kind of posts them on his website, and I don't think it's really in a format that is suitable to have a lot of information on, but he makes amazing graphs. <laughs> and this, uh, the highest peak for the bees is during the middle of the season, June, July. And this six mites per 100 bees, that's a 6% infestation rate. As you start declining, because the bees are preparing themselves for winter, um, they stop producing as many bees and so their population goes down. Well, the raw mites, they, they don't care that it's winter. They're, they're still going. So they're always lagging behind. And Randy Oliver said that it's this part right here, that's what leads to colony death during the winter. Because the amount of mites that are inside of the hive is just too great for the bees to actually be able to live. So what does that lead to? Death. <laughs> <laughs> so extreme infestation leads to vermoosis. And what they found is that uh, varroa mites are vectors of viruses. They are extremely efficient at harboring viruses and then not being affected by them at all. They have found up to 20 different viruses that are harbored inside the varroa mite that actually they transfer to the, to the bees. And in the bees, it, it's just devastating to them, like the bee earlier with the deformed wings and the shriveled up body. That is also the deadliest virus that they transmit is deformed wing virus. So, varroa mites also weaken the immune system. So when the, that mother mite first goes into the cell, she cuts a hole into the side of the baby bee because she's developed, her exoskeleton is hardened. So when her offspring are born out, they're, they haven't molted yet, they're not hardened up. They can't actually pierce the cuticle of the, of the honeybee. So if you have a permanent hole inside of you, or not inside of you, but a permanent hole that leads to the inside of you, that's just a perfect 
pathway for pathogens and all sorts of other nasty stuff to, to get in you. Honeybees cannot repair this because they do not go through any, any other moltings. Once they emerge as an adult bee, that's it. They, they don't mold anymore like a crab or other types of insects. Crab's not an insect, I know, but just as an example. And Rosencrantz found that it leads to decreased body weight. So a infestation by just a single mite on a, a female worker bee reduces body weight by 7%. Infestation on drones leads to a decreased body weight of 11 to 19%. And the reason why that would be is because it was first believed that the varroa mites were feeding on the human lymph of honeybees. And it was recently discovered within the past uh, seven or eight years that they are actually feeding on the fat bodies of the honeybees. And this makes sense why it decreases the body weight and also why they're more devastating to honeybees during the winter because the quote unquote winter bees that are produced by the the, uh, summer bees they have larger uh, fat bodies in them because they have to survive up to six months with, with no incoming nectar or pollen this interrupts the bee jobs um, everything in the hive is controlled by smell well they found Rosencrantz found that infestation by mites also causes the honeybees to start doing their jobs earlier. Well, they've been doing this for millions of years. They kind of have it down to, a, to an exact science. This mite comes in and now they're doing their job earlier. So now you might have bees that are going out to fly that don't have developed flight muscles, or they haven't been able to fully mature as an adult, even though they emerge as an adult bee, they still develop internally for a little bit and they may not be able to locate the hive because they're just, they're just not old enough to be able to do that. So that leads to lifespan shortened because if you're going outside of the hive before you're ready to, more than likely you're gonna die. And all of this leads up to a cascade effect of colony death. So you might be saying, do something bees. <laughs> well, they, they are doing something. Um, the Leconte study in France actually showed that, which I was not expecting those results at all. Um, I do want to make one distinction here, European versus American hives. Uh, Europe is on that landmass that the Varroa destructor mite originates from. And also, I did not notice this when I first got this picture, this drone is heavily infested with mites. We've got one mite here, another here, another there and another right there. So they play their hide and seek job very well. Uh, so the Leconte study um, that was looking at the untreated hives in France, they were hoping for a treatment free bees and they actually found that uh, honeybee hives can live <coughs> without being treated. However, there are some uh, differences between treated and untreated. So one was that honey yield. And also they found that it makes them more susceptible to brood diseases. They produce less brood. They're less gentle, which means they're more prone to stinging. That right there is probably the biggest factor on why not to let uh, the bees go treatment free on varroa mites. Because not all bees are kept out in fields. Some of them are kept in cities and you know, you don't want them just running around killing, or not killing people. You don't want to run around stinging people. I mean, it can kill people. True, it can, but I try not to promote the killer bee thing. <laughs> so, uh, Leconte et al. found that they have a uh, trait called Roa sensitive hygienic behavior, VSH for short. And that basically is just summed up with this picture right here. So we saw this earlier, but now we see this side with a nurse bee that possesses VSH behavior. She detects that there's something wrong underneath this uh, brood cap with the developing pupa. So she pokes a hole in it. Somehow, they don't know how, she senses varroa mites in there. Well, she opens the cell, yanks out the, uh, the pupa and tosses it outside the hive to die. So you sacrifice the one to save the many. Unfortunately, 
even though um, they have been able to breed for this VSH gene, they, it typically does not last past the, the first generation of offspring. Bees and trying to get them to keep traits is not an exact science. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. Uh, other behaviors that bees have is grooming. They physically go over themselves and they also go, go over their uh, hive mates, um, cleaning them, removing mites, and ones that are more aggressive about it, like that drone uh, we saw, they could actually pull those mites off of that drone. And the ones that are very good at grooming, they actually harass that varroa mite and they found bite marks on the uh, mite. Doesn't kill them, but they're also harassing them, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Another tactic that they found um, that honeybees use against burrow mites is swarming, but swarming is typically not looked at favorably with beekeepers because you lose half your hive and then they don't produce honey that much. But Africanized honeybees and African honeybees, which they are not the same thing, they swarm a lot and as I mentioned with that swarming behavior it interrupts the, the life cycle of the varroa mite. So it's a good thing for the bees but not so good for us. And with that Leconte et al pointed out that there are risks. So first risk was that reduced honey yield. So was reduced honey yield makes them less gentle, so they're more prone to stinging people, and they're more susceptible to brood diseases. This is a big one because if you have diseases that are impacting your developing baby bees, you're clearly not gonna have a large foraging force because your bees are not reproducing at a high enough rate. Farmers aren't gonna like that because if you show up with a hive that has half of the population that it would have in it, they're like, well, I'm not gonna pay you for this. And also, then you know, you don't get almonds, oranges, apples, a bunch, bunch of different foods. And they found that uh, bees that, produce, that possess this BSH trait, they produce less brood overall. So in addition to having baby bees that are more susceptible to disease, they also produce less bees, so they have smaller hives. This goes against pretty much everything that we have selectively bred bees for over the thousands of years. So my conclusion is that Apis mellifera actually has many latent defenses that help it combat the Roa destructor. However, there are two differences between Apis serrana and Apis mellifera. So with Apis serrana, we have a smaller nest size. They only have between five to 7,000 bees inside of their hives at any time. They're only found in Eastern Asia, so they're not being trucked all over the world, shipped in boats and I don't think they fly them on planes. That would be scary, bees on planes. <laughs> um, and they co-evolved with Varroa Destructor. Varroa Destructor is not the only Varroa mite. There are actually many different mites. Uh, Dr. Delaplane had a nice little summation on the Varroa mites and European honeybees. Out of all the Varroa mites, Varroa Destructor is the only one that parasitizes the European honeybee. And even though it's the most deadly, that means that they're actually resistant or I think he, the exact word he uses was immune to up to 90% of the known varroa mite species. So that's good. So differences with um, Apis mellifera is they have a massive, massive nest size. So whereas Asian honeybee has five to 7,000, Apis mellifera has 50 to 80,000 bees. And they have a worldwide distribution, which also helped the varroa mite gain worldwide dominance. And they did not co-evolve, but they still have genes to help them combat the varroa mite. And with that massive nest size, you have a host that has never dealt with you before. And so now you have basically just a smorgasbord of food. Whereas five to 7,000, that's not that, not that big. 50 to 80,000, you just have a huge population growth. And usually what will happen is when the varroa mite will kill off a hive, um, that mite, stays inside the hive, other bees come and rob out that hive and take the resources and mites that are just waiting and then they just hop on those bees like in that gif and then they go to their mites and it's just just a cascade effect and they call that a varroa bomb. 
So my hypothesis, I say that it was not supported because I said that uh, the European honeybee did not co-evolve with row destructors, so it had no natural defenses against it. Well, Rosencrantz and Leconte found that they actually do, which I had not heard of. I heard of some of this, but I did not know that they could live for up to 11 years being untreated. That's pretty much unheard of. But as I also mentioned, Europe has been dealing with the Varroa destructor mite for quite a bit longer than we have. So their bees have had time to reactivate those genes. That being said, the reason why I think European honeybees are more susceptible to the Varroa mite is selective breeding. So all those races of bees that I mentioned, we have bees that uh, they produce more honey, they produce more brood, and they're more gentle. Well, with the risk of having that VSH trait, that's everything that we have selectively bred for. So now if we're breeding for them to have that VSH trait back, you get less honey, less bees, and more aggressive bees. So they're kind of working against each other. So we need human intervention monitoring and testing and once it reaches a certain threshold we uh, we treat with miticides and to help the bees that being said with uh, human intervention as always we mess everything up <laughs> thank you and I know that went over time a little bit but if anybody has any questions feel free to look through five minutes Sorry, I'll fly back for 35 minutes, we're good. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Bobby? So, um, you said that uh, the, they've been breeding for the LSH, but it's difficult. Is that because of the whole haploid diploid thing? the randomization of who becomes the queen? That could be, but typically all the traits that we want from honeybees, they come from the drones. And the drones are hard to control because drones don't just stay to their hive. They go out and they fly around looking for queens and if they don't find them, they can smell other hives and then they'll fly into those hives and the bees from that hive, they just, they just let them come in. They're like, hey, come on in and have a party. Um, whereas if it was worker bees, they actually actively kick them out. They don't let them in. Drones are free to come and go as they please. Um, but it, it could be because of haplodiploidy. Um, and also queens, if they're not artificially inseminated, they go and they fly out and they can mate with any, any drones because bees can fly up for six miles and queens try to fly as far away from their hives as they can because they, don't, they want to prevent inbreeding. Drones come from a much, much larger area. So I actually forgot to mention this, oh, so I'm glad you asked that. So uh, the first things we used were synthetic miticides, and they're highly effective against the varroa mite. They're also highly effective against the bees. So there was a, a fine balance that you had to, to get there, and a lot of beekeepers, they would inadvertently kill their bees. But what happened is that it would kill 95 to 99% of the, of the varroa mites. Well, that one to 5% that wasn't killed are now resistant to that and you breed for basically super mites. So um, there was a synthetic miticide called uh, amitraz that was used in Europe for, for many, many, many years. And the reason why is because it was highly effective. Well, then it just slowly stopped working and they're like, well, why did it stop working? And it's because it did jack to the varroa mites. They just laughed at it. So now we've switched over to organic acids and um, I cannot remember her name, but she's with UGA. I know her name's Jennifer something, uh, Dr. I can't think of her name. But um, the acid we use is oxalic acid and uh, formic acid, which are naturally found inside the hives. And oxalic acid is found in honey and formic acid comes from ants. Um, 
it's not harmful to the bees unless you just like massively dose them with it. Uh, but it, it kills like 100% of the mites. Um, and that doctor that I talked to about oxalic acid, she said it's pretty much, I think her name's Dr. Jennifer Berry. Um, she said that you pretty much can't develop a resistance to acid because if you were to slowly drip acid on your skin for like your life, it's, it's not gonna harden up. It's just gonna constantly eat through it. So, and they don't know exactly how oxalic acid works to kill the mites. They just know that it does. Yes. If it's already found in the hives, wouldn't that be like a natural defense? Is it just not high enough concentration? Really? It's not high enough concentration, okay. and it's also um, not as a gas. So oh, okay. what we so do is, just, is we take the crystals yeah. and you expose them to heat to sublimate them to turn them into a gas, and that coats the entire hive, and it also coats the mites. It's believed that somehow the crystals, once they uh, reform, stick to the mites and cause them to detach from the bees, but they don't know how it kills them. And it also elicits a grooming behavior on the bees themselves. So maybe uh, as they start cleaning the crystals off of them, they they find mites and they pull them off. But uh, it's typically found in the honey, and the honey is not in a in a form where it can you know coat the hive. Yes. So what do you treat your do you treat your bees on? Yeah, I use uh, oxalic acid, and this year I have uh, formic acid as well to to mix it up. Have you ever had any? So, I meant to mention this as well. Uh, if you have beehives anywhere in the world, except we're on some small isolated islands or Australia, you have varroa mites. There's no question about it. Every single hive in the world has varroa mites. Because like I said, humans are real great at messing <laughs> things up. <laughs> yes? Um, you mentioned the female mites, they become sterile when they get older. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's the best solution is trying to figure out how to that so uh, Rosencrantz, he actually said that that would be a good topic um, to look into, but the problem with that is that nobody has been able to get mice to reproduce inside the lab. Um, they just, without having bees, and then that leads to a point to where you have to rely on another organism to keep this organism alive, and then this organism needs a specific way in order for it to uh, to live for the for the grow mites to actually live as well. And they just it's not like a model organism like fruit fly is, where you know it's just easily bred in the lab. So they acknowledge that it would be awesome to find a way to make the mites infertile, but one they don't know why some of them become infertile as they age and why others don't and they also they, they can't find a way to reproduce them in the lab to basically make it easier for researchers to be able to do that do they still use the technique to get rid of the mites by dusting the bees you know what i'm talking about talking about sugar dusting yeah um, some of them do but it's not really effective okay. um, I've seen that done, and it creates ghost bees. And yeah, out. and that's actually what happens with the oxalic acid too. Um, so the bees, some well, it pisses them off. Um, <laughs> you're, you're sticking this thing inside of the hive that it, the tip of it is roughly 235 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, it puts all this smoke inside the hive, and then they will come rushing out trying to sting me, and they're just powder white. It's like they've been rolled in confectionery sugar. Um, but the, the sugar dusting, they believe that the reason why that is somewhat effective is that it causes uh, grooming behavior. So they're mm -hmm. going around trying to clean the bees, but it doesn't kill them. So the mites will drop down to the bottom right. and then they'll just crawl back up. Okay. You just try to help them and they get mad at you? Yeah, yeah. Human <laughs> thing. Any other questions? All right. All right. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, if you would please uh, take a minute or two, finish your uh, emails. Um, when you're done, you can just give them to me. Uh, next week, unfortunately, eight o'clock. Sorry. Um, you've gotten away with it for almost half the semester, not having to come in at eight. So. Um, so next week it's who? Jordan and Kaylee.
so again, I, I'll calculate your grade after your presentation. Um, so if you want to know your grade, I will uh, I can tell you that. But you don't get the evals back until the end of the semester. Thanks, Bobby. Our Thank you. That was fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, Jasmine's got a uh, uh, Excel sheet that she updates. So oh. I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> 